questions. Thank you, Paul. Well, welcome to everybody. Good to see um, everybody there. Zach, Roxy, Adelia, Matteo, Todd, Carla, Diana, Lauren, Matt, Daniel. I'm sort of cheating a little bit. You've all got your names there. You know, I do like the feeling that we can sort of get to know one another a little bit here. Um, Zoom is always harder than a classroom, of course, or, a, you know, an in-person situation, but it has certain real advantages. Um, uh, let's see, I, I want to do something a little bit different today. You have probably, you know, if you've got your own copy of the Cantos there, you have probably noticed that we've come up through page 95. The current edition of the Cantos, though, is, I can't remember what it is, but it's about 820 pages, which is to say we are not even one-eighth of the way through. And we are coming, we are coming, this is our penultimate class of the original scheduling. And I, I think we are deep enough into it now, having gone through, um, we skipped two of the early cantos and we may go back to them, but to have a sense that 20 cantos in some of the um, major thematic material coming into this book, all this material that was sort of imported into the 20th century's sense of poetry, poetics, literature coming through this book, but having gone through, you know, 20 cantos more or less, it would now be maybe really helpful for a couple of reasons to step back a little bit and take an overview of the architecture of the full cantos. A um, couple of reasons is one is that very often material you encounter as you go through the cantos uh, echoes or rhymes with or resonates in some way or even illuminates cantos that happen earlier. And so it is a book that if you get serious about, um, you will be reading in great loops and cycles and recursions and returning again and again to earlier material, which means earlier material illuminates later material in the book, later material not only echoes, but um, enriches material that has happened earlier. And for that reason, I think, you know, now would be a good time to look at kind of what is this book? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold a couple of things up, you know, here, um, which you don't need to look at terribly closely, but this is my 1972 version of the Cantos, which is <coughs> most of what a current edition has. It's about 20 some pages shy of it, but this is effectively the Cantos. But of course, the Cantos, um, from our point in history, looks like a single book. And there's no doubt that it was a single writing project as Ezra Pound evolved it. Um, yeah, there I see uh, Diana holding up what must be the current, more or less the current paperback iteration, um, and also Adelia there. So you can, you know, you can see it as a book. Yep, yeah, there's Matteo with his hardback with that beautiful, um, uh, what do you call it, like rust colored, rust orange sienna um, cloth on it. So there have been various different iterations, but I think um, all of you probably had the experience of reading the poetry of um, some of the elders of our more immediate world. And when you saw big collected poems, you thought, what the hell is this? You know, I never read Philip Whalen as like a big brick. I read Philip Whalen and all these fugitive little publications or, you know, I know who, Joanne Kiger, Gary Snyder, Lorene Niedecker, so, you know, whoever you read, you probably read as books came out and were much more manageable volumes. So to think of the cantos 
did not emerge as a single book, as though it was one great daunting writing project, but it came out in um, a number of different volumes. I've never seen Cantos 1 to 16, the first book form publication of any of the Cantos, because that was a limited edition, 300 copies back in uh, you know, around 1921 or something, and apparently a rather poor printing job coming out of France, or at least the guy who um, published it was in France. The first um, sort of more regularly available book edition of the Cantos was the book that we are in now. We are in a draft of 30 cantos. And this has been republished as a single volume by New Directions. And one of the reasons I like this particularly is because I seem to, I feel like I know the first 30 cantos better than much of the later cantos, but also it is the introductory volume that really is the introduction not only to many of the themes and topics and ideas and reference points, um, but in some ways it's like the clearest of all the books. Um, but it is the opening, the opening volume. Um, that was followed up by a volume called 11 New Cantos, rather, you know, rather slender. Um, this was a before New Directions had picked up Erzur Pound or really been founded. This is a Farrer and Reinhardt Inc. Um, edition. Um, 11 new cantos would have been the second volume. I don't have a copy here to show, but that was followed by um, a volume called, what was it called? It was called The Fifth Decad or Decad of Cantos, which was again a Farrer Reinhardt title, but they seem to have dropped it pretty quickly and New Directions bought the pages and issued it under their own imprint. So if you look up a fifth decad or decad of Cantos, you'll find two kind of almost simultaneous editions in America, a Farrer Reinhardt and then a New Directions who had bought up the, the pages of it. So that there is three volumes that takes you through about Canto 50. Um, then there is a big chunk of Cantos. Um, I should also mention that in England and presumably in the British Commonwealth, you would buy not New Directions editions, but Faber and Faber editions. And they're pretty much exactly the same. Faber and Faber have the copyright for the British Commonwealth. And by that, by, by mid cantos, the editor of Faber and Faber was Ezra Pound's friend T.S. Eliot. While when once New Directions started, it was Ezra Pound's friend James Laughlin who did the publishing. Uh, so a fifth decade of Cantos was then followed by a volume very simply titled Cantos LII or Cantos 52 um, to Cantos LXXI or 71, 52 to 71. So that was 20 more Cantos, and that had no separate title aside from the numbers of the Cantos. And that I do not have a copy of to hold up to, um, you know, uh, to show you. Uh, then major events happened in Ezra Pound's life, which I talked about a little bit, including the outbreak of World War II, his um, identification with Italy, and then the Mussolini regime. And then after the war ended, his imprisonment by the Americans who were um, committed to trying him and hanging him for treason for having published on Rome radio. Um, the book that Ezra Pound wrote in uh, his first incarceration at the DTC or detention 
uh, I'm sorry, DTC, Detention Training Center in Pisa, Italy, was issued as a separate volume also, and has been in the last maybe 10 or 15 years republished also by New Direction, the Pisan Cantos. And this is an excellent volume because the person who put this current edition of the piece on Cantos, Richard Seaberth, is a great scholar of Pound, and it's filled the volume up with notes at the back. So the piece on Cantos is a volume maybe worth having. Um, once Pound got back to the United States and was incarcerated in St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the Criminally Insane, New Directions issued Section Rock Drill with that old Henri Godier Brezhka drawing of Ezra Pound on the cover. So section rock drill, that was followed by Thrones, uh, which came out shortly after Pound was released from St. Elizabeth's. And um, after that, the canto was rather than coming to a grand conclusion, um, as if we, when we get that far, we'll talk about how they, it's not exactly as though they petered out, but they became sparer and sparer. And there was a final volume drafts and fragments of cantos 110 through 117. Yeah, Zach, I see you have a question there. Yeah. Um... So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to like how, e like what does each section of the cantos um, as it came out and it's sort of structured <clears throat> in this way, is there something that each section that was published individually does to kind of move it forward or backwards or spiral or yeah, um, yeah, it does exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because in a moment, what I wanted to do is share my screen and go through a couple of pages that show the kind of structure and what each of the books does. Um, and I think I'll do it on the screen because um, then we can kind of look at each book and sort of, you know, see where it um appears in his life and what the, you know, the major way that I would recommend thinking about them. And then it's a document which I will send to Paul and he can um, post it so you can print it out as sort of a reference guide. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Brilliant. Thank you. Good. Um, I will say, you know, this final volume that came out, Drafts and Fragments, um, you can see we've gone from a draft of 30 cantos, the provisional nature of that first book, a draft, to a final book that is, if not more provisional, it's maybe more despairing, let's say. You know, it would be a hard, psychologically, I think, very hard to think that, a, let's say, 820-page epic poem fell apart into fragments at the end of it. And that is something that's very much embedded in Ezra Pound's life and his, you know, maybe personal psychology of those final years. Um, but this is a book that when it came out, probably the sense was this is all there is because this book came out the same year of Ezra Pound's death. Subsequently, scholars, and I don't know exactly who, you know, it may be scholars, it may be copyright holders like Ezra Pound's daughter, or it may be his editors like James Laughlin, but they juggled the order of a few of these poems. So that ones that finish up my old volume is probably not the same as the last poem in Matteo's old volume. And then they found another poem, which Ezra Pound had written on, this is to be the final canto. And then that was added in. Um, this particular Drafts and Fragments, um, I don't know the full story of it um, because I have not 
you know, gone digging around enough. But what Edward Sander, Ed Sanders says is that somehow a bootleg manuscript of these cantos ended up with the poet Tom Clark and Tom Clark being a gadabout handed the uh, manuscript to Ed Sanders who did an edition of his magazine, um, Fuck You, a Journal of the Arts as drafts and fragments of the cantos. Ed Sanders in his memoir uh, says that he received a letter from a lawyer claiming to represent new directions saying cease and desist. You do not have permission to publish those poems. Uh, comply right away or you'll face legal action. Ed Sanders wrote back to the lawyer saying, don't contact me again or a giant green toad will appear in your dreams and ejaculate down your throat. And he says he never heard again from the lawyer. Uh, so a little bit of a, I don't know what to say, spotty uh, history of publishing around this final volume, um, which is really a heartbreaking volume. It is really heartbreaking. Um, we've seen a bit of Ezra Pound's bluster. There will be more of it along the way, but it is really quite remarkable to see uh, when he really took stock of his effort to write a great anti-war poem, and then the world ended up in World War II, and then his personal life was one of decades of imprisonment and being reviled by Americans publicly in the press. Um, you know, very, very difficult end of his life. And by the time you get to this volume, it's what I think uh, I've, I've heard referred to as the cantos of contrition. And there is something, I think, deeper than contrition here. Um, but now would be a good time to just look at the overall architecture and go book by book as Zach, you were asking and get a, you know, get a bit of a feel for what's happened here. So Paul, would I be able to share my screen? Absolutely, go right ahead. Now, can people see this? Is this large enough? Can you bump it up a little bit? I think about 150 should be good. Right over there, a little bit to the left. Right up, a little bit to the right now, where it says 125. If you could make where it says Zoom, yeah, make a little bit to the left of where your cursor is. Oh, where it I says see. Yeah. Good. 150 should be good. Yeah. Good. Sally, does that work for you? Sally Everybody had, see this okay? S Sally had mentioned last week that she wanted it to look a little bigger. Okay. So some of this is familiar because, um, Paul, you had posted this. Um, so I want to just kind of go through this a little bit. Structure and theme in the cantos of Ezra Pound. The first um, one here will be a draft of 30 cantos. And again, I want to go back to nota bene, you know, note well. This list is not meant to indicate that a particular canto is about a theme. You know, what I really try to do is highlight certain significant focus or, fo fo you know, focuses of a canto or to note new material when introduced by a canto most cantos are composed according to the ideogram method. This means they layer various time periods, actors, events, myths, and voices with the intent and intention that the why will eventually become clear by letting image, sound, and sense interplay with your psyche. So even though I may say something like um, this canto, canto has the troubadours, doesn't mean that that canto
feels like it's built around some translations or life stories of troubadours. So we've been going through a draft of 30 cantos. You know, we began with Odysseus and the shamanic journey to the dead. Canto two, the great metamorphosis of Lias or Dionysus, where the sailors on the boat turn into sea creatures. Um, Canto three brought in El Cid, a kind of glimpse of a hero who is embattled, almost prophetic of Ezra Pound if he's trying to be a hero of his own poem and discovering himself to be, you know, reviled throughout his home nation. We pass through these various um, initial cantos. We have the Malatesta cantos with the Tempio, which lasted from 8 to 11. We had a real introduction of economics coming with the guy Baldy Bacon, who bought up all the um, centavo, copper centavos in Cuba. Dos Santos contrasted with him, who bought up ships that had gone down with a load of cornmeal or something and used it to feed pigs. Um, a kind of balancing of non-productive, usurious money working with productive um, and clever use of money. Then we came to the Kung Canto. We had a couple of hell cantos, Kung the Confucius one, one of the most clear and readily anthologizable cantos. Then we had two cantos that were hell, pound naming names, though he had to um, expunge most of the letters of the names to meet um, his publisher's fears of libel, but very much following Dante's example, we had Hell's Mouth, and that took us through Canto 16, the very initial publication in book form. Then we've moved on a bit. We've had some purgatory money, currency, armaments, and banks, and then the last canto we went through was a return to Odysseus, the poem built around the troubadour Arnaud Daniel's poem and the anecdote of Ezra Pound going up to find old Levy, who could tell him about Neugandris and a lot of memories of Pound's walking trip through South France from his 1912 tour. Um, I'm not going to summarize these because we're going to keep going through them, but as you can see, each um, either individual canto or set of two or three cantos in a way forms a little ideogram or cluster or microcosm that you can look at, and we're going to end up with a complaint against pity, a song it contrasts what Pound saw as radiance, meaning really the intellectual radiance and artistic radiance of the medieval world with a kind of sloppiness of the modern. And this isn't just being Ezra Pound being grumpy about modernism like so many old people do. It has to do with his concern that capitalism and particularly usurious money practices have been destroying both thought and art. And that's where we'll end a draft of 30 cantos. The next 11 cantos very similarly can break down into clusters of two or one. The Jefferson Adams letters, this is largely cut ups, you could say, or rephrasings of the founders of the Constitution and the American Republic, particularly the dispute between Jefferson and Adams over the type of banking systems appropriate. Remember, we're, our country did something really quite remarkable, shaking off, you know, the uh, old mantle of a monarchy and then having to figure out not only how to build a government, but what that government's connection would be with banking systems, with currency, with the... Um, printing of currency, and from there we're going to go into a hell or purgatory that includes money, again, and warfare, and the very first Chinese ideogram that appears in the cantos in 34. 
Um, we'll move through those. You can see more banks on the falsification of money. We'll have Odysseus returning. We'll have somebody whose name is probably still familiar, J.P. Morgan, um, whose name got added in with some character named Chase to make a really big bank these days. Um, these guys are still alive. And then what I consider Ezra Pound's fatal mistake, his uh, meeting with Mussolini where he came out thinking, huh, you know, that Benito, he's not such a bad guy. He knows how to read poetry. Um, so that is 11 new cantos. The fifth decad of cantos, I can't remember if I called it this the heart of the cantos or I read somewhere that Ezra Pound called it the heart of the cantos. But again, it breaks down fairly neatly into you can look at each canto, and these are very, very different. I want to go through a few of these today a little bit. There's going to be a history of Florentine and Sienese banking where all the banking practices that come into the modern world get sort of hashed out in the towns of Florence and Siena in Italy. Other, other um, you know, these kind of nation states as well, but these are the ones that the documents that Pound builds into his cantos we're going to have some real looks at usury, but never forgetting that there's another side, that there's natural increase, the, nat the way the natural world works, which is connected to the mysteries of love. And this is going to be what this, I think, again, is really almost the heart of the cantos in some way. Um, now, I want to just go through this next nota bene to notice up through the fifth decad. So that would take us through Canto 51. I think most cantos can be singled out for theme or grouped into material introduced. Cantos written after 51, I think of as books. The rhythms and themes begin to operate in larger dimensions and much of the earlier material and insights that showed up in the first 51 cantos now begin to reappear as parts of other configurations. But it's almost as though up to Canto 51, you've re Pound really laid the ground. So while there's new material coming forward, um, it's happening in, I think, much larger chunks and you can see this book called cantos 52 to 71 that there is 20 cantos and they're neatly divided as about 10 cantos that go through there's something of a history of the chinese dynasties from the earliest records um up until nearly modern times that doesn't mean that all the material we've seen so far doesn't recur at moments to form part of the ideogram. But this is really a place um, where most readers totally bog down on the cantos because this really does feel like 10 cantos in which you need to follow the history of Chinese dynasties, particularly attendant to figures you've never heard of, places you've never heard of. Um, sort of movements of history that you wouldn't have gotten out of American school books and a great deal of looking at monetary practices. And there are, there's a constant, uh, what I would call rhyming or building of ideograms with material we've already seen, but the real point of these cantos is to make a large ideogram of how China developed historically and what the relationship was, not just with banking practices, but with interest rates and pounds interest in usury. After that, 10 cantos that other people have that feeling of, I don't know how to slog through these. These are from letters and documents of John Adams. 
laying out his approach to banking. Again, there are going to be troubadours, there's going to be Odysseus, there's going to be Chinese philosophy, there's going to be Hell Realm, there's going to be Sappho, there's going to be all sorts of material in there. But basic point of these cantos is to try to look at a banking system that did not get instituted in the United States that Ezra Pound felt might have saved the United States from the real ravages of capitalism, which were still undergoing, and you could say maybe more than ever. Okay, so that's that group, and this really takes us up to World War II. So by the time Pound knocked off, this book was published in 1940, and he would not really write another or publish another book of cantos until 1948. So there was this long time in here um, where really what he did was he no longer wrote cantos. He went on Rome radio and broadcast on the radio. Um, though in 1944, when Italy was or really the Mussolini regime was defeated, let's say, um, and Mussolini was freed from prison by some German commandos and set up for a kind of puppet republic at a place called Salo. Um, Pound wrote two cantos in Italian. These were written in 1944, but they did not come into the cantos until much later. These were suppressed by his publishers who didn't want him hung and his family who did not want him to be seen as pro-Italian in World War II. Um, and uh, one of these cantos, there's a translation of by Ezra Pound. The other has been translated by somebody else. And I think maybe both translations are in the current edition of the cantos. But anyhow, those are those are in now. But those were never published in Ezra Pound's lifetime, published in 1986 or inserted in the cantos then. He died in 72. So these are really like kind of almost apocryphal cantos, you could say. Um, and they were two cantos that you know, written in Italian at the close of World War II, unpublished until after Pound's death, and Canto 72 in Pound's own translation is in current editions. And that Canto 72 harkens back to some of the very early material Pound was working with. It's really a no play. It is so ghostly. Um, it's really a, you know, really a remarkable thing. But after you know, his time in the tiger cage at the detention center in Pisa. And then uh, he got to St. Elizabeth's and he published the next book, The Pisan Cantos. And this is 11 cantos. And this is what he won the Bowling and Prize for. And this is a book utterly by, its, by itself. You can't divide these cantos into 11 separate cantos, it really is a single read. Um, these are, I should say, written in the detention training center at Pisa. If you remember the story when Pound was arrested and taken from his home, he grabbed two books, a book of Confucius and put it in one pocket and a Chinese dictionary and put it in the other pocket and walked out of his house thinking he may never return. And those were the only books he had while at the DTC. Um, he saw some Time and Life magazines. He probably saw some International Herald Tribunes. He found an old anthology of poetry in the, uh, in the um, outhouse at Pisa. And so some material comes into the Pisan cantos that he's pulled out of this old anthology of poetry. But the remarkable thing about these Pisan cantos is he wrote them without any books. And his cantos have been so full of books all the way through that you know now he is, in a sense, reduced only to what's in his own mind, his memories, his old friendships, his old lovers, his old... Um, Renaissance in London and 
some Chinese material and whatever news he can pick up from the GIs who are guarding the camp or his fellow prisoners at the camp. Once he gets back to St. Elizabeth's rock drill again, another 11 cantos, 85 to 95, written at St. Elizabeth's, named for a sculpture done by a friend of his, British sculptor named Epstein, did a sculpture called Rock Drill that looks like a rock drill. And the poems on the page actually look like you're drilling down into rock. And they're largely based on etymologies of Chinese ideograms. Um, the poetry in English is following ideograms or characters, Chinese characters that are stacked vertically descending the page. Um, so the whole thing feels both visually and metaphorically like Pound is drilling deep. And so that book really holds its own as a single book, too. I don't think you can really separate out the 11 different cantos. You can, and some have been anthologized separately. Um, but that's based on editors finding a particular chunk that they feel you can lift out. Um, it's full of what we've seen with the Eleusinian mysteries, the um, almost Mediterranean coastlines, the landscapes of southern France, and yet they're built around these etymologies of Chinese ideograms. At that point, Pound was getting set to be, well, he was, you know, after he published them in 55, he had three more years at St. Elizabeth's, and he decided it was time to write Paradise, just like Dante had with the Paradiso after having done the Inferno, the Purgatorio, he did the Paradiso. So Pound called this next volume Thrones, which is a, after a level of the Catholic cosmology of heaven that Dante worked with. Um, I should say these terms de los cantares, it's unknown really, I think, why Pound used that. That's just, you know, Spanish for Rock Drill 85 to 95 of the Cantos, Thrones 96 to 109 of the Cantos. Um, it's Pound trying to write Paradise and Thrones being Dante's name for the Circuit of Paradise just below the summit, so just below the Godhead. Um, and yeah, all the material that we've seen in earlier Cantos is coming back again and again and creating these very large rhythmic patterns, you could say, or even rhythms throughout, you know, lines, particular words, particular images, lines recurring, but lines often take 30 pages to recur. So that's a very large rhythmic recurrence there. Then was Pound was released in 1958 from St. Elizabeth's. This book came out in 59. And over the next 11 years, the very slender group of drafts and fragments, which among other things, Pound is now back among books. And he has, he somehow discovers this double volume about a tribe in the mountains near the Tibet, the mountains of China, with a tribe called the Naki. And Pound begins to incorporate rituals and ritual material from there, um, bringing it out of this anthropologist book, not that he had any contact with the Naki himself, but scholars eventually who went through these big volumes discovered that these were largely rituals to ward off suicide, which I know nothing about with the Naki, why they would have such rituals, but it does tell you something about Pound's state of mind near the end of his life when he was in such despair about the ruin of his own life, the ruin of the world, um, his, you know, everybody's inability to stop a second and maybe third war from happening. And so, as I say, the order of cantos and placement of a final canto in this last section has changed several times. 
And then later on, there was the eventual insertion of the solo cantos into the single volume edition. So, you know, again, just a quick run through. We had a draft of 30 cantos, which is where we are now. 11 new cantos, its own volume. The fifth decad of cantos, its own volume. Cantos 52 to 71, their own volume. The suppressed solo cantos. The peace on cantos, which even people who don't like Ezra Pound have to grumble and concede that this is a pretty good set of poems here. Um, though I think it loses so much if you don't know what came before and what comes after. Then the volume rock drill, the volume thrones, and the drafts and fragments. So I'm going to have Paul post this so you can use this as a kind of reference to the overall architecture. But I thought this would be a good time to begin to see where are we in the cantos and what does this big book really mean or have to offer? Because at the pace we're going, you know, we've been, we've gone six weeks and only gone 20, you know, less than an eighth of the number of pages deep, basically, and haven't even hit the Chinese ideograms or characters, which will start to spill all over the page. We've had plenty of Greek, we've had plenty of French, Italian, Provençal, um, but there's still material including even Egyptian, which will show up in the late, late cantos because um, Ezra Pound's daughter who cared for him near the end of his life was married to an Egyptologist. And from him, Boris Durachowicz, Ezra Pound began to learn um, some of the Egyptian hieroglyphs, really. Let's see what this canto says. Sounds like Pound bought fully into the notion that mankind is on a trajectory of steady improvement. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, maybe so, maybe so. Yeah, um, I think more he was looking at the wreckage of World War I and thinking, you know, maybe optimistically you could say a new civilization will come out of the ruins of it. And then his incredible despair when not only did a great new civilization come out of it, but more ruinous wars than ever before. And, you know, those people who try to separate the poetry from the madness or the awful politics, I think, often miss his, you know, for us now, the world word fascism has such an ugly tone to it, particularly because it's lofted around in a lot of directions. But at one point, fascism was the definition of a type of government. And, you know, in the days of the you know, you know, pre-World War II, there were, seemed to be only two real alternatives to capitalism. One was communism and the Marx-Lenin wing of that seemed problematic. And the alternative, especially if you um, were isolated in Italy, would have been a Mussolini fascism, which was to say a strong government and government control over things like banks and railroads and um, you know industry and that sort of thing. But fascism didn't have the um, meaning that it does as you know most people use it now. Um, but, you know, as what I wanted to say is try to separate Pound's poetry from his political beliefs and his economic theories and all of that, even if a lot of that stuff seems wacko now or really um, distressing, uh, you know, you can't do it. And that's one of the reasons that this book feels so central or something. Not only did he bring lots of material into the 20th century, but he really grappled with things in the 20th century that we're still grappling with, you know, entirely as we move along from banks and the manufacture of currency. I mean, think of Bitcoin, you know, how different is Bitcoin from what John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were ar arguing over, you know, how much control does 
or should a government or the banks have over the manufacturer of the currency? So, you know, these things are still really with us. Questions or thoughts here? Okay, that's it for the architecture then. What I'd like to do is maybe um, take an opportunity just to look at a few of the cantos going along because um, it may just, you know, show in a way some of these themes that we've, you know, looked at reappearing in certain ways. So the first thing I would like to do um, is, um, oh, I'm going to have to um, give you some page numbers here, Paul, if that's okay. Sure. So let us try to go to Canto 39. I want to take a look at 39. This is page 193, it should be. And this will be in the 11 new cantos, in other words, the second volume, really, after a draft of 30 cantos. So 193. And um, let's see, what I will do is probably read through it. So this is, um, you know, if you think if it were 20, so this is going about twice as far into the book as we've gotten this far, but I want to show you a few of the moves that he's made. We're going to um, move back into the voice of Odysseus. We're also going to have some of these great sounds that he's beginning to incorporate in. And um, a kind of certain vocabulary, you'll see very quickly that he's going to start putting in vocabulary that um, uh, poets of a previous generation didn't put in. So, Canto 39, and this is often called by people who want to, you know, name them Circe's Bower or in Circe's Bower. And if you remember, Circe is the witch or one of the witches who, you know, bewitched and held Odysseus and his men um, as they tried to get back from Troy. Desolate is the roof the cat sat. Desolate is the iron rail that he walked and the corner post whence he greeted the sunrise. In hill path, duk, duk, of the loom, duk, duk, and the sharp sound of a song under olives. This is again his walking trip in, um, you know, southern France. He's hearing the loom, he's under the olive trees, he's hearing this took and the sharp sound of a song under olives. When I lay in the ingle of Circe, anybody remember that word ingle? El Panor and Canto One fell from Circe's ingle. Ingle is the old um, Anglo-Saxon or, you know, old English word for fireplace, really. So anybody know what an ingle nook is? Remember those old, like, kind of seats by a fireplace because you wanted to wrap up, you know, before central heating. If you sat by a stove or fireplace, you had an ingle nook. Like when I lay in the, what would you say, Matthew? A, a, a heart or a, ch a hearth or a chimney where you get cozy near the fire. Yeah, yeah, that's what the ingle is, or the ingle nook. Yeah, yeah the ingle, the ingle nook. Yeah, it's the chimney, the hearth, and the you know seats by it. When I lay in the ingle of Circe, I heard a song of that kind. Fat panther lay by me. Girls talk there of fucking. Beasts talk there of eating. All heavy with sleep. Fucked girls and fat leopards. Lions lock me with Circe's tisane. Girls leery with Circe's tisane. Kaka, Farmak, Edokan. I want to point out something that he's starting to do now. He's gotten a little nervous that his readers aren't following him because they don't 
can't read the Greek lettering. So he's actually beginning to double up here um, where he puts in the Greek and then Romanizes it. Um, and this basically means she gave them evil drugs, if you know, kaka as evil and the pharmac adoka. And this really means she gave them evil drugs. So the lions loggy with Circe's to Saint, to Saint, of course, a, you know, what a, uh, like a tea, really, to Saint. Girls leery with Circe's to Saint. Kaka pharmac edokan, kaka pharmac edokan. She gave them evil drugs. The house of smooth stone that you can see from a distance. Lugoi orestoroi ede leontes. Um, mountain where wolves and lions, and you can see it down there. Lugoi orestoroi ede leontes. Wolf to curry favor for food, born to Helios and Parsis that had Pasiphae for a twin, Venter Venustus, Cunicultrix of the Velvet Marge, Fernovum, Canorum, Fernovum, spring overborne into summer, late spring in the leafy autumn, Calon. Adaye, Kalon Adaye, which is basically a praise um, to sing beautifully. And notice, you know, the uppercase letters here too, something that other My connection apparently is unstable, although we have fiber optics. So that's why I made you and uh, Matthew co-hosts. So I'll get the, if you can hear me, just give me a thumbs up yep. and I'll put I'll put the, uh, the screen share back on. Good. Good, so if you'll scroll up into that next page, Paul. First honey and cheese, honey first and then acorns, honey at the start and then acorns. What is this referring to? Anybody see what's going on here? Remember, Circe is the one that turned all of Odysseus's men into pigs. So they've all gone to dinner at her house. And at first they all get honey and that's great. And by the time they've been turned into pigs, all they get to eat is acorns. First honey and cheese, it's the banquet. Honey at first and then acorns. Honey at the start and then acorns. Honey and wine and then acorns. Song sharp at the edge, her crotch like a young sapling. Ila dolore ob mutui parater vocem. She hushed with grief, the voice likewise. And then we've got this string here of five lines in the Greek, um, which I've got a little translation here. I'll give you just so you can sort of see where we are. This would be the voice, a voice to Odysseus. But first you must complete another journey and come to the house of Hades and dread Persephone to seek soothsaying of the Theban Tiresias, the blind seer. So we're all the way back to Canto One in some sense, or even before that. This is the voice saying, before you go home, you have to go on another journey. You have to go to Hades and talk to Tiresias, the blind seer. 
When Hathor was bound in that box, afloat on the sea wave, came Mava swimming with light hand lifted in overstroke. Sea blossom wreathed in her locks. What are you, box? I am Hathor. Che mai de me no se parte il diletto for vida di folgore. Came here with Glaucus unnoticed. Nec ivi in harem, nec in harem ingressum. Discuss this in bed, said the lady. Une cae filotete afata kirk. Une cae filotete afata kirk. Estalamon, estalamon. Eurylocus, Maser, better there with good acorns than with a crab for an eye and thirty fathom of fishes. You all remember Eurylocus was one of the ones who poured in the meat and sweet wine in the opening canto. And this is now after they've all, all the men have shipwrecked and gone to the bottom of the ocean. So, so if somebody, this is this is Odysseus thinking Eurylochus and Macer, two of his warriors, two of his men, better there with good acorns as pigs and Circe's bower than with a crab for an eye and 30 fathom of fishes. This is really interesting the way Pound's getting so into this. I mean, you know, really like deeply into it and creating his own voices, but it really puts us right here in Circe's um, Bower, your locus macer better there with good acorns than with a crab for an eye and thirty fathom of fishes, green swish in the socket. I think that's a fantastic line, green swish in the socket. You know, if you didn't know where you were, you'd think this would have had to be surrealism. Even Dada, what is this green swish in the socket? But if you sort of know where we are, under the portico, Kirke, and Kirke is the Greek there for what we call who we call Circe. I think you must be Odysseus. Feel better when you have eaten. Always with your mind on the past. Ad orcum autumn kiscam nondum nave nigra parvenit. Been to hell in a boat yet? Look at the difference in voices here. You know, we've gone from um, better there with good acorns than with a crab for an eye and 30 fathom of fishes. That could be Shakespeare. Green swish in a socket is not Shakespeare. And here we've got been to a hell in a boat yet. And and the um the uh Latin here, which is from the translation of the Odyssey, ad orcum autumn kiscam nondum nave nigra parvena, has anyone ever been to hell in a black ship? That's that nave nigra, the black boat or black ship. And then Pound's voice comes in, so colloquial, this always knocks me out. Been to hell in a boat yet? You know, he may be listening to some of the old blues, you know, going to hell in a bucket, but at least I'm enjoying the ride. This is this is going to hell in a boat, but you know, that's where we are. Sumus in fide, pueleque canamus sub nocte which is we have the protection and girls let us sing under night there in the glade to Flora's night with hyacinthus, with the crocus spring sharp in the grass. Notice now we've just moved very quickly from hell to a kind of um, litany of life and springtime and vegetative growth, Flora, the goddess, of course, of vegetation, with hyacinth, with the crocus, spring sharp in the grass. This is his 1912 walk in South France appearing again. 50 and 40 men together. Every man I take kudoniae in the spring, the quinces, between April and Mercha, with sap new in the bow. But that April and Mercha. 
But he remember uh, when that April with his with his uh, what is it with his shoulder Soto that Soto. opening line of Canterbury Charles. Tales. Yeah. yeah, this is actually from a, the Merch the April and Mercha is a quick. You could say it's a quote, or you could say it's a collaging in, but it's from the old um, anonymous poem, Allison, which, by the way, happened to be a great favorite of Charles Olson, the uh, old English um, Allison poem. Between April and Mercha, with sap new in the bow, with plum flowers above them, with almond on the black bow, Remember the black bow of petals on a wet black bow? I mean, this is not just quotes coming up from the cantos, but quotes coming up out of all of Pound's poetry. With jasmine and olive leaf to the beat of the measure, from star up to the half dark, from half dark to half dark, unceasing the measure, almost back in those old Anglo-Saxon ballads, from star up to the half dark, from half dark to half dark, unceasing the measure, flank by flank on the headland, with the goddess's eyes to seaward, by Circeo, by Terracina, with the stone eyes white toward the sea, with one measure unceasing, Fac deum est factus fair novum. Of course, fair novum means new spring. Fair novum, fair novum. Thus made the spring. Can see but their eyes in the dark, not the bow that he walked on. Look at that. Isn't that sort of incredible? I mean, talk about when Allen Ginsberg said, You taught us to see. I think of what he's teaching us to see there, can see but their eyes in the dark, not the bow that he walked on. Is that a cat or a bird or who knows, but you know, just sort of extraordinary. Beaten from flesh into light, hath swallowed the fireball, a traverso la folie, or, you know, through the leaves, have swallowed the fireball, a traverso la folie, his rod hath made God in my belly, sic loquitor nupta cantat sic nupta, which is so the bride speaks, so the bride sings, dark shoulders have stirred the lightning, a girl's arms have nested the fire, not I, but the handmaid kindled, cantat sic nupta, I have eaten the flame. So this is really, you know, sexual magic here, sexual magic, sexual mysticism. We've gone from hell to the celebration of spring. You know, we're starting to see this whole cycle here with multiple languages, multiple references, but, um, you know, this is in a sense like a ritualization of the old, perhaps Eleusinian mysteries, but the mystery of the rebirth of the light, the sexuality of the mammal realm, the um, fecundity of the vegetative realm. So that's Canto 39. Um, and I think from there, what we want to do is perhaps go to jump over for something very, very different feeling. We're going to go over to page 229, Paul, Canto 45, at the heart of the cantos in the fifth decad. So we're going to the next book. So if you think of that, the tenderness of that sexual mysticism we just had, the... Um, Ability to move from the bewitchery of Circe's bower to the old Eleusinian mysteries and the mysticism of sexuality. Um, and now we're going to go to something very different, page 229. Get there.
and this is as well known and as much anthologized as any Ezra Pound canto. So if it seems familiar, um, oh, actually, scroll up to the previous page, Paul. Just the bottom of it. We're going to have here. Um, oh no, this is. Oh, they removed. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. Notice the last two lines. The foundation, Sienna. This is the foundation of the banks, has been to keep bridal on usury. Nicolo Picciolomini Proveditore. Okay, go to the next page, Paul. With usura. With usura hath no man a house of good stone. Each block cut smooth and well fitting, that design might cover their face. With usura hath no man a painted paradise on his church wall. Harps et luz, or where virgin receiveth message and halo projects from incision. With usura seeth no man Gonzaga his heirs and his concubines. No picture is made to endure nor to live with, but it is made to sell and sell quickly. With usura sin against nature is thy bread evermore of stale rags, is thy bread dry as paper with no mountain wheat no strong flower. With usura the line grows thick. With usura is no clear demarcation and no man can find sight for his dwelling. Stone cutter is kept from his stone. Weaver is kept from his loom. With usura wool comes not to market. Sheep bringeth no gain with usura. Usura is a muran. Usura blunteth the needle in the maid's hand and stoppeth the spinner's cunning. Pietro Lombardo came not by usura. Duccio came not by usura. Nor Pier della Francesca. Zwan Bellin not by usura. Nor was La Calunia painted. Came not by usura. Angelico came not Ambrogio. Bradis, came no church of cut stone signed, Adamo me fecit, not by usura Saint Trophim, not by usura Saint Hilaire, usura rusteth the chisel, and rusteth the craft and the craftsman. Cramoisy is unbroidered, emerald findeth no memling, usureth slayeth the child in the womb, it stayeth the young man's courting, it had brought palsy to bed, lieth between the young bride and her bridegroom, contra naturam, they have brought whores for Eleusis, corpses are set to banquet at behest of usura. Nota bene, usury, a charge for the use of purchasing power, levied without regard to production, often without regard to the possibilities of production, hence the failure of the Medici Bank. Well, think of that as a tone. Paul, could you scroll just back a little bit up on this page? I want to go up to um, look at line four here. Came no church of cut stone signed Adamo me fecit. This was an inscription on one of the columns of the Sigismundo Tempio um, that was cut in the marble by a craftsman named Adam. This is not about the biblical Adam. This was a craftsman named Adam, who was so proud of his work, at least that's how Ezra Pound interpreted it, that he wrote, um, 
made by me, Adam. This was Feckett. This was, you know, built by me, Adam. Adamo me Feckett. And Pound Sense is in the age of usury. There's no such pride anymore. No church of cut stone signed Adamo me Feckett. And then he re he remembers two of the major sacred spots where I think he may have had some kind of epiphany in Southern France. Saint Trophime and Saint Hilaire are these gorgeous cathedrals in Southern France that are associated with the troubadours and that Pound went into and studied the architecture and you know, stained glass. And I think this is where he had, you know, one of his epiphanies. Not by Usura Saint Trophim, not by Usura Saint Hilaire. Um, you may or may not agree with him, but he is really contrasting the ages of usury with the ages of pride and craftsmanship, including architecture and all the arts. And, you know, all those figures that come not by Usura are Italian artists and architects whose work he had seen. So, you know, this is a, really a heartfelt, um, you know, view of his. And you can see it's like the opposite of the end of the last poem we read. The last poem was the mysteries of the natural increase, the vegetation, the sexual rituals and magic. And here, as he says, you know, it's like about seven lines from the bottom, Usura slayeth the child in the womb. It stayeth the young man's courting. It hath brought palsy to bed, lieth between the young bride and her bridegroom. Contra naturam. So this goes all the way back to that canto of, um, the tale of the honest sailor, or the tale of Baldy Bacon, the tale of uh, La Posada, the Portuguese guy who figured out a way to work with nature. When the corn was sea wrecked, he retrieved it and fed it to the pigs. And that's, in Pound's view, working with nature as opposed to making money off of money. So now we can look at this Nota Bene usury, a charge for the use of purchasing power. That's what banks do, levied without regard to production, often without regard to the possibilities of production. Think of the um, collapse of the family farm in America. The banks charged these guys money without regard to production or the possibilities of production. You can't go to a bank and say, I'm sorry, I can't pay you this year. You know, there was a drought and the crops failed. The bank says, doesn't matter, you know, you've got interest to pay. Otherwise we're foreclosing. Well, let's turn the page. I think Roxy's got a question, Andrew. Oh, okay, good, Roxy, please. Well, I mean, this poem sort of resonates with two different poets backward and forward at once who are connected. Blake and Ginsburg in the sense of, you know, Blake's London talking about the child being um, born dead in the womb due to the philandering, you know, hypocritical, rich husbands bringing home of syphilis from prostitution, which he condemns. And then, of course, um, part two of Howell. Um, of Ginsburg, course, yeah, yeah. Moloch and, um, Moloch. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then and the young men that are sent to war, whose lives are ruined. Um, and so this repetition, this rhythm and these references, really, do you think that Ginsburg was borrowing not only content, but form in the in the making of his poem? Very much. If you, you know, if you were going to give it an old classical name, this form is called anaphora, which yeah. means to throw back. And it means that you begin each line with, you know, a word or a phrase or something. So with usura, with usura, with usura. And Ginsburg is directly pulling on that for Moloch, 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 starting, um, you know, each of those lines of part two, but also part one of how, you know, who have, you know, I've seen the best of my, minds of my generation, 
who have, who have, who have. He varies it a bit, but that's, yeah, he's he's drawing, I think, directly off of this for the Moloch, both form and content. Which kind of um, cleaves to some, I guess, sonic version of the ritualization that you were talking about earlier, if a mantra of repetition as such, the creation of a a horizon note, who, 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 or Moloch, 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 kind of puts us into a state of mind, a almost hypnotized state of mind. It's a different kind of dream-like um, strategy mm -hmm. other than the visual. Yeah. It's kind of softened for this message, which otherwise you might want to run away from. You know, I, I, I sometimes turn my, my news off these days because there's so much bad news. But if it's delivered in this way, then... It will sink in. And it's interesting that Pound uses the word usura because that's becoming like the old medieval term. And um, then throwing in a lot, you know, a lot of the, you know, ETH endings for verbs, you know, so it's feeling archaic in a way. So this also feels you know, almost, maybe not biblical, but archaic in a way, ritualistic and archaic. Let's turn the page, Paul, to page 231. I mean, just right where we were and look at the following canto, just how it opens. We've just had with usura. And look at the sudden change in voice, you know, just such an abrupt change. And if you will say that this tale teaches a lesson or that the Reverend Eliot has found a more natural language, you who think you will get through hell in a hurry. There's a line that to me has always been an anchor for the cantos. You who think you will get through hell in a hurry. You know, and as a Buddhist, this has always meant a lot to me. You know, it's like in Buddhism, you don't get through hell in a hurry. You got to bring everybody with you. You know, this isn't just you on your own. Paul, yeah. Those spaces, uh, you know, maybe a, a little bit about the lineation that Pound has used. And I love that spacing in there. Get through hell in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to his lineation and, and this technique at all? Um. What I don't know is whether Pound originally wrote that as a single line, you who think you will, I suspect that, and they indented it, but it's it's hard to know. Um, but, you know, unlike, say, the usura, this, I think, you know, you could almost say this is Pound trying to show, demonstrate a natural language. What would be a natural language? The language of regular speech. I mean, this is interesting because he seems to be contrasting himself with the Reverend Eliot, you know, and I think that's very specific. That's like, you know, you're not going to get through hell quickly just because you convert to Christianity. There's bigger things here, you know, religion is not going to save you here. Um, but there's also, you know, this sort of funny thing, if you will say that this tale teaches a lesson, you know, I don't know, these, you know, these I'm like hesitant to interpret, including the lineation, because I think the lineation is, um, you know, very precise. You who think you will get through hell in a hurry, right there. And then look at the change of tone. That day there was cloud over Zoagli, and for three days snow cloud over the sea, banked like a line of mountains. Snow fell, or rain fell stolid, a wall of lines so that you could see where the air stopped open, and where the rain fell beside it, or the snow fell beside it. Seventeen years on this case, nineteen years, 90 years on this case. And the fuzzy bloke says, legs no pants ever would fit. If 
That is so. Any government worth a damn can pay dividends? The major chewed it a bit and says, yes, yeah. you mean instead of collecting taxes? Instead of collecting taxes. That office, did you see the decennio? Stop there, go just back up a little bit, Paul. So we've had that moment of the clouds over the, you know, the bank of clouds over the sea, the snow cloud over the sea, banked like a line of mountains, snow or rain, a wall of lines. That has brought us out of that other language in which he was contesting or addressing Eliot or something. And then suddenly 17 years on this case. So I think I've figured out what he's referring specifically to here, which is that this fifth decad was published in 1937. That means that approximately 17 years ago in 1920, was when Pound started to realize that it's not Aphrodite that's causing wars. It's money and it's a collusion of the money makers, the bankers, the armaments people. And notice, you know, we just talked about that repetition 17 years on this case, 19 years, 90 years on this case. That might even give a little bit of a clue that we're moving into some more, you know, forceful language. And the fuzzy bloke says, and this is supposed to be pound himself, legs no pants ever would fit. He's, we're suddenly coming in the middle of a conversation with a guy named Major Douglas. If that is so, any government worth a damn can pay dividends? The major chewed it a bit and says, yeah, yeah. You mean instead of collecting taxes? Instead of collecting taxes. Pound had started to believe here, along with some of those early founding fathers of the US, that if we had not privatized the banks, if the government handled the money, any government worth a damn wouldn't have to collect taxes. They'd get all they needed from handling the money. The fatal mistake was to give money over to the private sector, and now the government to fund itself has to collect taxes. You may or may not believe in that, but this is pound not so much telling us what to think, but showing us his thought. He's in conversation with this Major Douglas, who was one of his, um, the people he drew on for his understanding of what was going on. Um, yeah, so an economy of surplus. Um, I mean, if you think what the banks are making by lending out money and what the government could be making if the government was doing that and didn't have to charge us taxes. Anyhow, I'm not good at money things like that, but I think I understand where some of the outrage in here is coming. Let's just go a little because now we're going to feel the outrage. Decenio Exposition, reconstructed office of Il Popolo, well, ours was like that minus the Mills bomb and the teapot, heavy lip chap at the desk, one half green eye. Pound comes back on page 233, hath benefit of interest on all the monies which it, the bank, creates out of nothing. Let me go back to that. Since Paul's not here, if you've got the book in front of you, look a third of the way down on page 233 hath benefit of interest on all the monies which it, the bank, creates out of nothing. This is what was beginning to really become a, you know, in a way like the metaphysics of evil for pound. The banks make money out of nothing. How do they do that? They, char 
They loan you fake money. They loan you something that isn't really money. It's like a nothing. And they charge interest on it. And they get all that interest. They loan something that isn't really there. And they make money on it. And that's, you know, that's the um, fundamental problem with the economy. And this becomes, I think, not just, I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say this is just like a economic insight. This is like a metaphysics for Pound. This is like the center of what he is trying to do with this book, is to point out what is really going on. This is like Dante going down into hell and discovering all the ancient popes who fiddled with the money. I think we've lost Pound here, but if you've got the book on page 233 and can find that, it's underlined in the book. It's a third of the way down. Hath benefit of interest on all the monies which it, the bank, creates out of nothing. And then Pound comes back, semi-private inducement, said Mr. Rothschild. Hell knows which Rothschild, 1861, 64, were there sometime. Very few people will understand this. Those who do will be occupied getting profits. The general public will probably not see it's against their interest. 17 years on the case. Here, gents, is the confession. Can we take this into court? Will any jury convict on this evidence? 1694, Anno Domini, on through the ages of usury, on, right on, into hair cloth, right on into rotten buildings, right on into London houses, ground rents, fetid brickwork. Will any jury convict them? Roxy, you brought up William Blake. That's William Blake right there. You know, the slums, the poorly built buildings, the ground rents, the London houses. And then something a little bit more esoteric found immediately then since the foundation of Regis professors was made to spread lies and teach wiggery. Will any jury convict them? The Macmillan Commission about 240 years late with great difficulty getting back to Patterson's, the bank makes it ex nihil. Those of you who know your Bible know, or you know, know your um, Christian metaphysics, that's an important term, ex nihil, out of nothing. The bank makes it ex nihil. God isn't making it ex nihil. The bank is making it out of nothing. Denied by five thousand professors will any jury convict him this case and with it the first part draws to a conclusion of the first phase of this opus mr marx carl did not foresee this conclusion you have seen a good deal of the evidence not knowing it evidence is monumentum Look about you. Look, if you can, at St. Peter's. Look at the Manchester slums. Look at Brazilian coffee or Chilean nitrates. This case is the first case. Different tone from the with usura. Um, yeah, as, as I see, Diana, you throwing your fist in the air. Um, I, sh I should explain that... Um, the Regis professors was an endowed professorship of, I think, five professors at Oxford, which seems to have been endowed by a bunch of bankers for sort of economics chairs, history chairs. And I think what outrage pound about this when he says um, the foundation of Regis professors was made to spread lies and teach wiggery. Will any jury convict them? Um, Denied by 5,000 professors, will any jury convict them? It's like the banks have got their professors in there. If you wanted to go to court and said, these guys are cooking up a new war, check out what they're doing with interest rates, check out what they're doing with machine guns, check out what they're doing with airplanes. If you brought that to court, professors, you know, 
planted in the universities who will come and say, well, I'm an expert on economics and what Mr. Pound is saying is complete tomfoolery or, you know, scuttlebutt or whatever word you want to use. But, you know, there's a paranoia in here, but just because he's paranoid doesn't mean he's wrong. Andrew, is this pre Mussolini? Because I'm I'm seeing him almost convicting the the commoners, the people that would be on the jury who would not convict the oligarchs. Would any jury convict him? It seems as though this is a kind of critique of a kind of populism that benefits from the oligarchs. And um, I guess that's not necessarily the case. I'm not making a complete parallel between MAGA and Mussolini. But it seems odd. It's well, the odd. other thing, we'll, we'll find places, and we found it all the way back in the hell cantos. Pound feels that there's a conspiracy around information, that real information is being suppressed by the publishing houses. And most of the poets are running away from this, unlike he felt... Dante didn't run away from this. Um, but that's a really good question. I don't know. Is it, there, there's, there may be a kind of pop populism, but I think almost more of what um, he's feeling here is this frustration that he's been trying to figure this thing out for 17 years, and he's starting to feel like he's figuring it out. But who do you go to if you say there's this giant conspiracy around making money in armaments? And you couldn't go into court because they've planted. And and I think, you know, I think aren't the juries in Britain different than the juries in America? You know, when he's talking about the Regis professors are there to spread misinformation and wiggery. And that's a good question. Are you referring to William Carlos Williams, Patterson? I don't know. Well, if you have the book on you're on page 234, we can look just at a couple more lines. We left off at about the sixth line down. This case is the first case, si requiris monumentum, which means if you require a monument, basically, maybe he's thinking of his book as a monument. This case is not the last case or the whole case. We ask a revision. We ask for enlightenment in a case moving concurrent. But this case is the first case. Bank creates it ex nihil, creates it to meet a need. Hic est hyper usura. Hic est hyper usura. You may remember that from the hell cantos. Here is hyper usury. And that was the great beast, Gerion, that Dante rode down into hell on the back of, and we saw for a moment in Canto, in the hell Canto, Canto 13 of Pound, uh, or is it 14, Canto 13 of 14, Hic est hyper usura. Um, and then Mr. Jefferson met it. No man hath natural right to exercise profession of lender, save him who hath it to lend. And then we're going to move into some of the um, or evidence that Pound, you know, has brought forward here. So some of this is what I, you know, have really, um, you know, thought of as, um, you know, it's part of the madness. It's part of the madness, you know. I mean, you know, it's interesting when you, Roxy, when you brought up, um, Ginsburg, you know, remember, Ginsburg is basically saying, you know, my friends have been driven mad. And a lot of them are right. You know, the madness isn't them, it's the civilization. And a lot of the women have been getting electroshock therapy. And a lot of the men have had drugs fed to them. And we know where the drugs come from. And I think Ginsburg is pulling directly from this kind of thing, you know, in Howell. Um, Pound's life is a case in point, right? Because it's, because as he was sort of um, resisting 
certain um, institutional understandings of what uh, I, at, at that point, I guess, um, he, he was deemed insane, um, not only for being a fascist, but for trying to, as you say, sow uncertainty or confusion. And mm -hmm. so confusion really was just departing from the party line, which was very. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the, in the late forties and fifties. Yeah. Correct. Well, you know, then, as I said, after rock drill, we go, I mean, I'm sorry, after the fifth decade, oh, Matteo, you've got a question. Oh yeah. Just a quick question. I mean, we could say he was involved in conspiracy theory of some sort, or he took one notion and, and made it at the center of his of his perspective. Was there a world of other people who were coming to this conclusion, or was he literally all alone? I mean, I know he's not on the internet, but was there a, some people that agreed with him? Well, the the guy, the, the major, we saw chewing on it and then saying, you know, yes, you know, any government, you know, worth its salt could pay dividends instead of charging taxes. That major, yeah. major Douglas would have been, you know, had a little following, you know, of economic policy. And there was a another guy who um, Pound was interested in, or actually not just a guy, but there was a little experiment that happened in a village in um, Switzerland, um, which is sort of interesting. It's um, It's been condescended to by ec economists as vegetable money. Um, but what the town decided to do was instead of um, having an economic policy that allowed people to hang on to wealth and therefore become wealthy and become capitalists, you would penalize them if they held on to wealth rather than circulating it. And the, the vegetable money, the, the policy in this town is they began to make their own money. And the way it worked is like, let's say you get a bank note today and today is January 14th, it's going to lose 10% of its value next month on this day. Uh, so on February 14th, you have to pay 10 cents and put a stamp on it. And if you hold it till March, you got to put another 10 cents on. So in 10 months, just to keep it active, you pay more than the money was worth right. to begin with. And this was to encourage people to reinvest and spend their money mm -hmm. and circulate the money so that it could not stay in the hands of one person. So there were a lot of these, you know, kind of ideas out there, which were, you know, going on. It may be a little bit like, you know, in the um, 60s and 70s when barter became, yeah. you know, yeah. something that, you know, serious thinking people mm -hmm. did, but people who talked about it were dismissed as hippies and craftspeople, you know. I went like, off oh, yeah, right. candle it was still cycling, and I'm like, well, <laughs> stop this and I'll come back in. Was that you, Paul, there? Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah it's me. I'm, I'm back. I didn't get a chance to meet myself. Great. Yeah. So anyhow, I think there were people out there, you know, talking mm -hmm. about these things and yeah. always have been and always will be, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the barter think... economy or gift economy or where an artist trades his painting for a house or a car yeah. or. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting if you, you know, to go back to Roxy, um, uh, the question about, you know, where did Ginsburg's matter come from? You know, who else was talking about economics? You know, or who, who else was calling out, you know, the leaders of, um, you know, who who's naming the names of bankers? Who is naming bankers and weapons manufacturers. I mean, Pound really pulled that out of Dante. And I think that's when, you know, people like Leroy Jones and Mitty Baraka or, you know, Allen Ginsberg say, you know, Ezra Pound really taught us something. He taught them not only like that you can bring this kind of stuff into poetry. Poetry doesn't just have to be about the flowers. You know, poetry can also be about who's in charge of the next war, and you can name names. Robert I, Duncan's so that's you know, a, passages. That's a, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Robert Duncan's passages really modeled on Ezra Pound here. You know, the, the naming names, naming LBJ and people. You know, for the bombing of Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. Which is ironic for all of the um, 
critique of political poetry that he engaged in with his best friend, Denise Levertov. But it, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how much of a Marxian was um, Pound, because in the reverence for craftsmanship that you were talking about in a previous contest, that just seems to come right out of Marx's, you know, description of the source of alienated labor, which is to strip the the spiritual component of pouring your spirit into the making of, say, a fender that gets ripped away from your spirit, goes on down the uh, factory assembly line, it goes into the modes of production for the profit of the owner of the factory, and then your spirit goes with it. So it's a real spiritual, you know, um, ideology, Marx. But any, anywho, I don't know um, Pound's relationship to Marx. Well, we just had that one line he had where, you know, this case and with it, the first part draws to a conclusion of the first phase of this opus. Mr. Marx, Carl did not foresee this conclusion. You have seen a good deal of the evidence, not knowing it evidence. Look about you. Look, if you can, at St. Peter's. Look at the Manchester slums. Look at Brazilian coffee or Chilean nitrates. So I think he's sort of saying that there's there was something missing in Marx. Marx may have missed the banking system, and he may have missed that the banks plant professors in the universities. You know, and of course, Marx was coming out of a very, very different culture than, you know, Pound, in a way, you could say, is coming from America and England, and Marx from somewhere else. Well, before we break for today, I want to read just a little bit more. Um, I think what we should do is go to just for a little bit of a taste of something. Paul, is Paul there? Yeah, Paul, can you bring up page 445? I can't, um, I can't bring up things right now because uh, when I got kicked out of the room, it started converting the oh. meeting recording and Matt started recording since then. And so I'll cobble together the two parts of it. But uh, what page were you asking for? I've got well, six. How many of you more. have the cantos in front of you or with you? How many of you have a copy? Oh, so pretty much everybody. Good. Let's go to the opening of the piece on cantos. First page of the piece on cantos, which would be LXXIV. Canto 74, probably page 445 if you've got the paperback edition. If you've got an earlier edition, it would be page 425. So if you can find the top of Canto 74, this is now going to be a voice from the outdoor cage of Tuscany. This is, you know, in Pisa. This is the opening of the Pisa and Cantos. The enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasant's bent shoulders. Manes, Manes was tanned and stuffed. Thus Ben and La Cara a Milano, by the heels at Milano. This is Benito Mussolini and his mistress Clara, who were shot and then hung by their heels at the town square. Thus Ben and La Cara a Milano by the heels at Milano that maggots should eat the dead bullock. Digonus, Digonus. Digonus means twice born. So Digonus, twice born, twice born. But the twice crucified, where in history will you find it? Yet say this to the possum, bang, not a whimper with a bang, not with a whimper. That famous line from T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Men. This is how, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Yet say this to the possum, bang, not a whimper. With a bang, not a whimper. Now, if you think of it, Ezra Pound has just been driven up from where he was originally incarcerated to the detention camp at Pisa. He's being driven through a war zone, World War II. There are bombed out buildings everywhere. There are bomb craters everywhere. There are devastated trees. There are hospitals that have been bombed. There are trees that have been bombed. A bang, not a whimper. 
and then going all the way back to Canto II to build the city of Dioce, whose terraces are the color of stars. The suave eyes, quiet, not scornful. Rain also is of the process. What you depart from is not the way. And olive tree blown white in the wind, washed in the Qiang and Han, two rivers of China. What whiteness will you add to this whiteness? What candor? The great periplum brings in the stars to our shore. You who have passed the pillars and outward from Heracles, when Lucifer fell in North Carolina, if the suave air give way to Sirocco, Oite, Oite, Odysseus, the name of my family, the wind also is of the process. That Oite is Odysseus's response to the Cyclops when the Cyclops has captured Odysseus and his men in the cave and says, I'm going to eat you guys tonight. And then he gets a little curious and he says, what's your name to Odysseus? And Odysseus, the wily-minded, the polymutos, the one of wily mind, knows that it may come in handy. And so he uses a foreign language that the Cyclops can't understand. He says, oite means no man, no man. And so if you remember when Odysseus and his men drive the... Um, masthead charred into the Cyclops' eyes, and he yells, and he yells for help, and all his friends on the adjacent islands shout, what happened to you? Who's hurt you? He yells back, oite, oite, nobody's hurt me. Oite's hurt me. No man has hurt me, no man. And Odysseus sends his men get away. Well, this is a very different tone. If the suave air give way to Scirocco, Oite, Oite, Odysseus, the name of my family. The wind also is of the process. Sorella, la luna, that sister moon, Sorella, la luna, my sister, the moon. Fear God and the stupidity of the populace. But a precise definition transmitted thus Sigismundo, thus Duccio, thus Juan Belen, or trust de vere with la sposa sponsor Christi in mosaic till our time. Deification of emperors, but a snotty barbarian ignorant of tongue history need not deceive one. Nor Charlie sings money on loan from Anonimo. That is, we suppose Charlie had some and in India the rate down to 18 per hundred but the local loan lies provided from imported bankers. So the total interest sweated out of the Indian farmers rose in Churchillian grandeur as when, and plus when, he returned to the putrid gold standard was about 1925. Oh, my England. That free speech without radio speech is as zero and but one point needed for Stalin. You need not, i.e. need not take over the means of production, money to signify work done inside a system and measured and wanted. I have not done unnecessary manual labor, says the RC Chaplain's Field Book, preparation before confession, squawky as larks over the death cells. Remember, he's in a death cell. He's at the end of seven cages. He's in a death cell. Squawky as lark over the death cells. Militarism progressing westward. Invest in Nix Noyes. And the Constitution in jeopardy. And that state of things not very new either. Of sapphire. For this stone giveth sleep. That's from Dante of Sapphire, for this stone give us sleep. And a little bit of biography there. He's in the tiger cage with Klieg lights on him day and night. 
and the sun broiling him and the rain hitting him and he can't sleep. And he breaks down eventually because of his sleeplessness. And he's praying for the sapphire, for this stone, give us sleep. Not words were to, to be faithful, nor deeds that they be re resolute. Only that bird hearted equity may timber and lay hold of the earth. And Rouse found they spoke of Elias in telling the tales of Odysseus. Oite, oite, I am no man. My name is no man. But one Gina is, so we say, one Jin or the man with an education and whose mouth was removed by his father because he made too many things, whereby cluttered the Bushman's baggage, V-Day, the expedition of Frobenius' pupils about 1938 to Australia. One Jin spoke and thereby created the named, thereby making clutter the bane of men moving. And so his mouth was removed, as you will find it removed in his pictures, in principio verbum paraclete, or the verbum perfectum, sincerely das from the death cells in sight of Mount Taishan at Pisa, as Fujiyama at Gardon, when the cat walked the top bar of the railing, and the water was still on the west side, flowing toward the Via Catulo, where with sound ever moving in diminutive palu flois boyos, that polus flois boyos is a Homer word. It's kind of onomatopoeic. It means loud roaring, and he applies it to the ocean. So with sound ever moving in diminutive holoflois boyos, in the stillness outlasting all wars. La donna, said Nicoletti, la donna, la donna. Cosa deve continuare? You know, why should one go on? Cosa deve continuare? Why would one go on? Se casco se bianca capello, non casco in ginocchion. And with one day's reading, a man may have the key in his hands. Lute of Gassir, who fasa, came a lion colored pup bringing fleas. Notice now what's happening the minutiae here. This guy's in the death cage came a lion-colored pup bringing fleas and a bird with white markings, a stepper under les six botons. The six botons are the six gallows. He's seeing these little birds stepping under the gallows. Absoudre, absolution. Que tu nous voy absoudre, lay there, Barabbas and two thieves lay beside him. Infantile synthesis and Barabbas. Minus Hemingway, minus Antire, ebullient. And by name, Thomas Wilson. Now he's talking about his fellow inmates. And by name, Thomas William Wilson. Mr. K said nothing foolish. The whole month, nothing foolish. If we weren't dumb, we wouldn't be here. And the lane gang, butterflies, mint, and lesbian sparrows, the voiceless with bum drum and banner, and the ideogram of the guard roosts. El triste pensier si volgue, adusel. A ventador va ir consire el tempo refolge. And at Limoges, the young salesman bowed with such French politeness. No, that is impossible. I've forgotten which city, 
but the caverns are less enchanting to the unskilled explorer than the Eurox is shown on the postals. We will see some roads again, question, possibly, but nothing appears much less great. Madame Pujol, and there was smell of mint under the tent flaps, especially after the rain, a white ox on the road toward Pisa, as if facing the tower, dark sheep in the drill field, and on wet days were clouds in the mountain, as if under the guard roosts. A lizard upheld me. The wild birds would not eat the white bread. From Mount Taishan to the sunset, from Kushrara stone to the tower, and this day the air was made open. For Quanon of all delights, Minus, Cletus, Kalamet, whose prayers the great scarab is bowed at the altar, the green light gleams in his shell, plowed in the sacred field and unwound the silkworms early in tensile. And the light of light is the virtu, sunt luminis ed eriginus scotus, as of shun on Mount Taishan, as in the hall of the forebears, as from the beginning wonders the paraclete that was present in Yao, the precision in Shun, the compassionate, and you, the guider of waters. Four giants at the four corners. This is the ideogram of the guard roosts, four giants at four corners. Three young men at the door, and they digged a ditch round about me lest the damp gnaw through my bones. To redeem Zion with justice, said Isaiah, not out on interest, said David Rex, the prime SOB. Like tensile immaculata, the sun's cord unspotted. Sunt lumina, said the Irishman to King Carolus. Omnia, all things that are, are lights. And they dug him up out of sepulture, swad distantly looking for Manichaeans. Les Abigenois, a problem of history, and the fleet at Salamis made with money lent by the state to the shipwrights. Tempus tocendi, tempus loquendi. A time to speak, a time to be silent. I think we'll stop there. You feel the difference of that? He may still be mad in the tiger cages, but something else has happened. Quanon appeared before him. All things that are, are light. The great virtue of humanitas. And he's sort of down. He's no longer raging about history. He's got a lion-colored pup, and that, that lion just kills me. And that day I was upheld by a lizard. You know, he really is no man. His family doesn't know where he is. Thinks he's going to be hung any day. Wait a day. Wait a day. And he sees the white birds white stepping under the gallows. I mean, it's a very, very different feeling, you know. He's on these cantos and, and the entirety of the piece on cantos move like that. Visions and grief and remorse and thoughts of all his friends who have died since he's been out of touch with them because of the war. You know, William Butler Yeats, James Joyce, Ford Maddox Ford. Um, he doesn't know what's happened to HD. He doesn't know what's happened to Hemingway. He, you know, he just, memories begin to come through and lines from his earlier cantos. 
So in a way, you can't really read the piece on Canto as well without knowing the earlier Cantos, because you've got to know those roads of France. You've got to know those troubadour poems. You've got to know the, the identification he has with Odysseus. Otherwise, this is just like a big mess of collage. But if you know that earlier material, the piece on Canto has just become luminous. So maybe this is a good moment. Tempest look Wendy. We'll um, you know break here and pick up next week. Andrew, your love for this work of literature comes through so clearly. And it's such a gift to have a guide like you take us through this. And sorry about my unstable connection talking about the internet this time. Uh, Matt, thanks for picking up some of the slack. And um, I'm grateful for all the folks who made this possible. That's all the folks in the room and the people who registered and left the room or didn't come today. So thanks. Again, the information is uh, on CascadiaPoeticsLab.org. Look for the 2024 link. Thursdays in March and April is our commercial message. Other than that, any, any last words, Andrew or anyone else? Well, I'll say since we'll be knocking off for a couple of months, you know, if anybody has any questions about what we've done so far during the week, bring questions in. Wait, yeah. this is our last class for- No, we've we got one more week, don't we, don't we Andrew? One more week, one more week. So I was saying bring in any questions next week if since we're knocking off for a bit, if you have, you know, something that you really like to ask. And, um, and um, maybe this, uh, I don't see him with us now, but, um, I think it was Zach who asked the question about, you know, how, what are the, you know, what are the different books like, you know, I think, I hope you felt the, the difference in tone between some of these earlier cantos and what happens. I mean, there may, you know, it's happening every day on our planet, but, you know, a person on death row out of contact with their family is about as reduced a human being as, you know, any human being can be. And, you know, if I, sob a little bit reading those those piece on cantos you know i find them just extraordinarily moving um after what's come before well be safe everybody be safe make quanon watch over all of you um you know and uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week then. You dear teacher. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Andrew.